unique set of, set of circumstances for, for all of us. Appreciate you guys taking the time um, to, to jump on uh, this call here with us and try to kind of talk to you a little bit about our preparation and what, what we've done to date to, to get ready for the, for the draft this, this weekend. Super excited about um, all the work that's gone into it from our scouts, from our, from our coaches, um, navigating a, a, a different set of a set of circumstances that um, none of us have have really ever dealt with, um, but but excited about the opportunity uh, to 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 build our football team with with some some players uh, over the weekend. Um, you know, Coach Vrabel and his staff have done a great job. Uh, Ryan Sal uh, Ryan Cowden, John Salgi, all of our scouts ha have done a great job with. Um, whether it was in meetings or, or getting information on players, um, getting in contact with players, um, all of that stuff has been, been really good um, for us. Um, and we feel good about where we're at and um, excited to continue to, to build uh, this football team and, and try to improve on what we, what we were able to accomplish last year. With that, um, okay. Yeah, John, uh, Teresa Walker has a question for both of y'all to start it off. Fire away, Teresa. Raves, I think you're muted, so. Took me a second to unmute. Uh, for John, at this point, uh, there were reports of a uh, draft run through this morning. Uh, did that take part and, and how did it work for your end? Yeah, so it's it's this afternoon. Um, we're we're going to work through that, you know, as soon as we get off uh, the call here. We've got IT here is at my house now, just finalizing some some phones and, and some computers, um, making sure we have everything from a tech standpoint um, and, and looking forward to going that going through that this afternoon uh, with with the league and the other 31 teams uh, to make sure that we're that we're all on the same page. Has there been any talk in prepping for the draft for contingency for if preseason games, regular season games get moved, games without fans at this point? Uh, not to not to my knowledge, uh, Teresa. You know we're kind of at the at the mercy of, of the league there. Uh, they'll dictate and 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 you know kind of divulge that information um, if if that if that is in fact the case uh, when when they see fit. And for Mike, hope you're doing well as well. Uh, you might. I'm um, good. Uh, you might want to work on that backdrop for Thursday night. I'm just saying. What do we uh, got? We got the grease board here. We're working football, Teresa. It's all white from here, is all I'm saying. But uh, for a more serious point, are you all able to get started with your off-season program virtually? Is that start? You know, you had originally been scheduled to start today. Are you able to start that yet, or what? Where's that in the process of? Yeah, we're uh, anticipating that uh, we'll be off and running on the 27th. Um, we, we had two choices. Returning coaches had two choices of the 20th or the 27th. Um, could go three weeks. And so we thought instead of having a, a week off and starting on the 20th, we're just going to start on the 27th and kind of go straight through. And at that point in time, just would take it uh, one day at a time, try to focus on some, some positive learning uh, and, and really get our guys um, – you know, brought back up to speed on the things that we've um, changed and the things that we're going to continue to remain consistent at. Uh, we got a question from Jim Wyatt for John. Hey, Jim. John, how you doing? I want to ask you about this year's draft and maybe how the strengths of it match up with the needs for your football team. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I talked about it bef before a little bit at the combine, uh, but have, you know, having, um, been able to, to kind of dig through these position groups. Uh, we, we feel like there's, there's players really across the board um, that, that there's, there's depth at, at, at the at certain position groups. Um, some positions are a little more top heavy, maybe, maybe than others, but we will feel like we've got some players identified uh, really that we think, I mean, you never know once, once it, you know, once the draft unfolds where guys are going to go. Um, but we feel like there's guys in, in all the rounds uh, that, that we can, you know, that we'll look to try to add uh, to help the football team. And looking at the draft a little further, is there an, what, what positions would you say the draft is maybe the deepest? Well, I think it's been widely talked about this, the receipt, the receiver group, um, you know, there, there's, they're, they come in all shapes and sizes. There's, 
there's there's big physical receivers there's there's smaller faster guys there's the crafty route runners there's guys with the, you know the ball that you know, go with the ball in their hands um you know i think that the old line group's got some some depth at it i think the d-line group has some depth at it um i think there's some some runners um there, there's there's pretty good depth there and there's some there's some length and size in the secondary uh, John Glennon had a question for both John and Mike. Morning, John. John, how are you? Good, man. Good, good, good. Uh, I know you just talked a little bit about the uh, the depth there, but I, I wonder how unusual is it to have uh, such a strong crop of tackles this year? It seems like they're becoming increasingly rare. And, and does that possibly make it any more likely that you that you go after one early this year because you don't know, you know, what next year's crop or, or future crops might look like at that position? Yeah, that's I mean, that that's a position group. There's um, th this is kind of a unique draft year where you, you've got a, a, several guys at that position that um, that we feel can can step in and, and help our football team and help a lot of football teams uh, in the league. Um, and, and and those guys, those those big guys, they, they're not they're not walking around around Walmart or Target like um, they, they don't come around very often. Um, so um, you know we'll see kind of how the how the draft unfolds and see where that position group um, when when we're on the clock wh whether that if there's a player there how he stacks up to another player to, at a different position possibly um, and then and then make a call on it. But you're right, it's 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 kind of a I don't know if it's a a unique year uh, for that position group, but it's certainly a year where there's there's really good depth with with good players at it. Let me toss one more at you on the on the draft there, if I could. Um, sure. The 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 cornerback class, wondering if you guys uh, would uh, like or or uh, look very closely at someone who could step in and play slot immediately. How much that factors into a possible cornerback guy with the chance that Logan Ryan doesn't come back? Yeah, I think. Um, you know, I think we always talk about position versatility um, and the ability for for guys to play a couple of different spots. And, and we feel like there's some some players in in that corner group um, that that can play inside corner. I mean, there's a lot that you know that that Mike puts on those guys' plate. We spent a lot of time with with several guys in that position group, just seeing if they're going to be able to to handle the the mental component that's asked of that position group. And um, there's there's certainly guys in in that um, category that we think have versatility uh, to play on the outside and play on the inside. And one for for Mike also, please, um, Mike, with with the trade of uh, Jarrell, wondering how much of an urgency do you feel to add another you know high quality D lineman, or or on the other hand, I guess do you think Simmons has filled that spot? and that uh, it's not a huge priority at, at this point. Hello. I got you, John. I don't know if Braves is frozen, maybe. <laughs> he was stunned by the question. Shock and all. <laughs> uh, do you want to go ahead and, and, uh, and answer that, John? Or Yeah, I can, I can, I can speak to that, not to speak for, for Mike, but um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think Simmons um, ha has played there. He played there in college. He played there some for us last year. So, um, you know, I, I feel pretty good. Certainly, if, if there's somebody there that we think improves um, that position group and, and we like them maybe better than um, players at another position group, then we're, we won't hesitate to, to take a, a D lineman. Uh, again, I, I love those big guys. I don't think you can ever have enough offensive and defensive linemen, those lines of scrimmage, that's where it all starts. Um, but feel really good about the position group that that we have um, with with Jeffrey, with Daquan, with with adding Crawford and having Mac back and and, and Dickerson and Ivy and those guys um, feel like we've got really good competition, you know, across the board at those spots. Um, as we wait for Mike to get back, uh, Joe Rexroad had one for John. Hey, Joe. Oh, there we go. Hey, John, how you doing? Good, man. Good. Hey, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about, of course, the Davian Clowney. Uh, if there's anything you can tell us about 
where that is right now. And then also, correct me if I'm wrong, but you haven't really had a draft before where you had a guy like that sort of in the mix still, correct? I mean, you know, a, a, a potential pursuit of someone that could obviously significantly change your roster and, and your payroll going into a draft. And how, how does that impact how you approach this? Yeah, I think like with anything, um, you have to have a couple scenarios um, mapped out. Um, and, you know, I would say, it, and I talked about it last week uh, with a couple of the TV spots that, you know, we we, um, we haven't closed the door on anything, but I would say that we really haven't um, uh, inched closer to, to having any finale, finality to that either. Um, I mean, he's obviously a good football player. And uh, I think where we're at, um, depending upon who we pick, um, could potentially impact that. Um, but I would say it doesn't close the close the door on it completely either. Uh, again, like I said last week, you don't ever close the door on the, you know, potentially adding good football players to your team. Um, so we'll just kind of take it take it how it goes and. Um, and probably circle back with that one um, here this week or, or next week once the draft's over. Thanks, man. Um, uh, Gentry had a question for John. Yeah, hey, John, I'm curious. Hey, Gentry, how are we doing, man? Good. Um, I'm curious about the logistics of how things are going to work on draft night for you. Or I assume you're on a call with the people who would normally be in your own room. How difficult is it going to be for other teams to reach you? And I guess every team's going to kind of be dealing with that same thing. Yeah, so so we're going to have a couple of different um, you know things in place uh, here. That's why I've got three surfaces and an iPad on my desk here. Um, but I'll, I'll be in in one kind of channel, if you will, um, in a video conference call with our typical draft room participants. Um, and then there'll be another, um, you know, web conference call that I'll have with the scouts um, on, on another kind of channel. And then we have a couple different ways uh, of communicating with the league. Um, and I have my draft phone and my cell phone, which is um, kind of standard operating procedure. Um, and and I, I, we'll run through it today. We, we did a kind of an internal mock last week. Uh, with with our scouts and with our draft room, and, and it went pretty well. You know, we've got a couple of documents that we've got to have, and and being able to manipulate that, um, you know, whether it's the draft board or who's picking who, um, we've kind of assigned people to to that um, that they will work that. They'll be able to hear um, who gets selected, and they can make adjustments on the draft board, or if there's a trade, make adjustments to to our picks board. Um, so that I can see, you know, who's picking when and who's been taken. Um, and, and I'll have, you know, direct communication with um, with Coach Vrabel, um, everybody that's in the draft room and our scouts as well. If there's any aspect of this draft that concerns you the most, just in terms of logistics and what you might be able to do, what what is it about, about this year that concerns you the most? Well, I, I think my biggest concern was the ability to to make trades, um, and, and how that was gonna how that was gonna go off. I think that um, I feel a little bit more at ease now um, that that we we've got the draft phone set up, and there's a lot of trades that get done via cell phone. Like sometimes, like in typical draft years in the past, where I'll text you know another GM and say, "Hey, are you going to pick here? Would you be looking to move?" And they'll text me back and. I don't want to say you consummate a trade via text, but you at least get the ball rolling that way. Um, and then you pick up the phone and call. So I think that style of business with being able to move around on, on the draft board, um, we'll, we'll still be able to do that. Uh, Paul had a couple of questions for John. Hey, John, how much? Hey, morning, Paul. Uh, good, thanks. How many guys did you get to the facility for a visit before things were shut down? 10. 10. So uh, you feel pretty good about a third. You, you think that's about what most teams did. You have access to that information, right? 
Yeah, I think I, we may have, we may have been a little maybe may have had a few more than some teams, but I think there was you know that as we started to to talk to prospects, you know, on FaceTime or on Zoom calls, um, there were several that that were able to make trips uh, as well. Um, you know, certainly missing the the pro days, the private workouts, and and those other you know, 20 guys, you, you would obviously love to, to have gotten all of that accomplished, but, you know, we're all kind of fishing in the same pond uh, for lack of a better term. And um, it's the kind of the, the cards we've been dealt and, you know, we've been able to navigate it and feel pretty good about where we're at. Does that include locals or are you talking uh, out of town? Yeah, we didn't do the local. I mean, we typically have our local day. We would have had it last week and or in early April. Um, where we would have brought those those you know local guys in for the local day and, and worked out some of them, um, some of the more high profile players, um, we just bring them in if they're in town and they visit with us, um, but that we did not we were not able to to get the local uh, day worked in. How much do you have to think about um, contract status of Janu, Daquan, and Jayon as as you draft here or do you think optimistically about your ability to extend guys you want long term yeah i think you know we're, that's the, right now our focus is on on the draft um and, and and making sure we we try to come away with next weekend with with a bolstered roster and some some good players on our team and um you know there's there's guys on our team who you know, who who will circle up with you know, once the draft is over, once we get into training camp, you know, like we've we've done in the past um, with like KB, for example, you know, he got done last year in training camp. So, um, or, or Ben Jones, who, or whoever it may be, just to pick two examples there. Um, there's there's time to to work through all of that um, in the future. I know this mock is is scrambled. What what number pick do you have, and do you know who they're having you take? Uh, we have been advised, Paul, not to disclose any of this um, information. So I'll, I'll have to plead the fifth on that one. Mike, do you want to be a rebel on that and share? I don't even, it, it, I get a million emails from them. So they just tell me to be ready to go at noon. So that's what I'm going to do. Be ready to go at noon. Thank you both. Uh, Jane Slater had a question for uh, Mike. I'll just answer, I'll just ask this to both of you guys. Hi, Jane Slater, NFL Network, new to the beat. So thanks for doing this. Question for you about not obviously getting those guys in there for a workout. Is it a good or bad thing that there's a, a more heavy reliance on the tape? And are you at all concerned about some of the medical aspects of this? And is the league protecting you in, in any sense, given the circumstances? Um, as far as for bringing them in to, to work out, the only, the only guys we would be able to work out would be our local guys potentially. Uh, but the medical is extremely important. I mean, that's an important uh, component um, when you're making a decision on a player. So uh, we're relying heavily on, you know, the combine players um, and the guys that, that weren't able to go to the combine. Um, our, our training staff and our doctors have done um, an extreme amount of due diligence in talking with trainers and, and, and that have dealt with these prospects at their respective universities and trying to get as much medical information as possible and, and grading them, them accordingly. I think the tape is something from the, the coaching perspective that we always look at um, as far as the coordinators or the position coaches or the head coach in my perspective uh, is what we try to rely on. We're not, um, we're not scouts, we're coaches. And so, I think we, we rely on the tape and the interview and, and would we like to bring this guy, would we like to coach this guy and have him in our room uh, is something that from a coaching perspective, we would rely heavily on our evaluation as we talk with John and his department. You know, just to follow up that real quick, I did talk to one prospect and he said the one thing that he wishes he had with the virtual chats was something as simple as the strong handshake. Are you guys getting a sense of these players in those virtual chat room that you would typically get face-to-face, -face, what's been lacking and what have you gained from the virtual chats? I, I would think they've been great. I think John and I have enjoyed them. Um, I, I think we've really probably taken that to something where we had an opinion of a player or we thought about a player and then you, you meet with them for, for 30 or 40 minutes and, and you really get a sense of, do you want this guy to represent your organization? Um, and you want to work with him on a daily basis. Uh, so I think that those have been 
been really good to, to help build a profile of the player. And, and, I, and I would echo um, that, um, you know, we, we, some of the guys that we talked to at the combine, uh, we circled back with, and, and it's, it's, it's 18 minutes, it was 18 minutes this year per prospect. And um, these guys have a lot going on, with, whether it's medical or they're downstairs with a, what we call the train station interviewing with, you know, five or six teams in a row. And they've installed 48 plays over the course of um, three hours with the guys and they're, they're kind of, their heads swimming a little bit. Um, so when they come into your room, they're trying to make an impression on you, but they've just got so much on their plate. Um, and there's some guys that, you know, may not have passed that test in, in Indy or, you know, not fully passed it. Um, but we've been able to jump on calls with them and, and get to know them a little bit better in their setting and um, had a little bit better uh, impression of them. Uh, Terry McCormick had a question for both John and Mike. Morning, Terry. Okay, there. There we go. Terry's there. Okay. Uh, picking at 29, that's lower than you picked uh, in previous years, obviously, because of the success you had last year. But uh, given that in most drafts, there may not be 29 players with first round grades, that sort of thing, are you more apt to maybe want to trade down and uh, pick up some extra picks if possible? Yeah, you're, you're right. It's the lowest we've picked. I wish we were picking a little bit lower. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, a lot, a lot gets made up of this, this, you know, who, how many first round grades or, or, or that. And I think at the end of the day, we, we don't necessarily get caught up on who's got a first round grade or doesn't have a first round round grade. Uh, do we have a vision for the player? Is the player going to be able to come in and help our football team? And are we going to be able to, you know, to, to work with them on a day in and day out basis and, and make them a better player and then make us a better football team? Um, and we'll just kind of see how, how it goes. You're right. We've got to sit there and, and weather 28 picks. And um, when, when, when we're on the clock, you know, that's, it's no different than any other draft where if the phone rings, you, you take down the potential trade and, and, and you, you kind of value that relative to the player you're, you're thinking of picking. And can you get that player, if you have to slide back seven, eight, nine, ten 10 spots, do you think that player will be there? Or is there somebody similar that you like? Um, or are you better off just taking the player and not risking losing them? So all of those things and those decisions, um, you know, we've started to work through and um, we've talked through different scenarios. And as that manifests itself on the clock, we'll work through it. And this is for Mike. Uh, as far as the running back situation, looking for somebody to compliment Derrick Henry, uh, you looking for you want somebody that maybe is similar to Derrick, or would you prefer somebody that has a different skill set that uh, you can do some different things with? Terry, I don't know how many guys you're familiar with out there that are similar to Derrick, but if you can find them, let us know. Um, sure. So, with that being said, you know, I mean, just I think a. Um, you know, a player that uh, we, we feel like that can come in and play on all three downs and, and that really can help in the kicking game. Uh, somebody that can that can come in and be able to protect, you know, that we asked our guys to do a lot. And, um, you know, I think that John and I, they've been able to to put together a group of guys that, that we feel like can do that in, in different areas of this draft. And so, you know, we're obviously going to have to continue to take a look at that position to, to be able to give Derek some some help um, as the season goes on. Uh, Debbie Beauclair had a question for John. Hey, John. Um, hey, Dave. Just uh, you've made only 10 picks the last two years. Is is seven a good number this year, or, or do you have in your mind a goal to to maybe try and get a couple extra and, and beef up the, the youth of this team that way this year? Sorry about the dog. Somebody's trying to get in the house. Um, yeah, I think I think we um, the more picks you can have, the the, the better. Um, but you know, feel like we've got it. We've we've gotten we've got some we've got enough ammunition, um, draft pick wise, to make ourselves a better football team. Hopefully, um, but if if we, I think you would you could pull thirty one other GMs and ask them if they could if they could pick up another pick here, here or there. They would they would certainly enter, entertain that. So we'll kind of see how. 
things start to unfold on on Thursday and, and Friday and Saturday, and as as more picks potentially become available by, available by trade, um, we'll certainly entertain that. Would would you consider it kind of following up on Terry's question a, a big deal to to not pick in the first round if that's the way it works out? Um. No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I, I think from a football team, from a general managers, and not to speak for Mike, but we're just trying to make the football team better. It doesn't really matter. And we tell these players when when we we hang up the call with them, we're like, it, it really doesn't matter whether you go in the first round or the second round or the third round or the. I mean, it does from a compensation standpoint on their rookie contract to say there was a first round pick, but. Um, what matters is that they help the football team win. And um, you really won't know that until uh, until we, we tee it up and kick it off in September. Teron had a question for both John and Mike. Good morning. Hey, TD. All right. I, I wanted to ask you in regards to this this class of cornerbacks, because I feel like that's a pretty deep class. Can you speak to just how you could get help from day one all the way through day three? Yeah, I mean, I think there's some, there's, you know, it's, it's, it, there looks like there's some, some length at, at corner and there's some, there's some, there's some maybe smaller statured corners that still have some, some bite to them um, that look like they could play around the core of the formation, maybe as a, as a nickel corner. Um, but but you're right. I mean, there was several guys down at the um, at the Senior Bowl who, you know, they may not be first round picks, but they look they look you know competent enough to go out there and help a team. Um, and there was a couple at the East West Shrine game that we took notice of too. That you know that had that had good weeks down there. So um, as I said earlier, I think I think that um, I think that position group is is a is a pretty deep one that you know you can you can get guys that might can help you um, in in all three days of the draft. And when you're looking at position versatility, specifically on your roster, do you feel that a Dory Jackson is a guy that can, if need be, bump inside and give you an option at, at nickel? Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's played in there some, whether it was adjusting to a formation or, or, or company. I mean, he, I think he shows a willingness to tackle. I think he's got pretty good match quickness and the ability to mirror. So. At the end of the day, you know, Coach Vrabel and, and his staff, uh, Mike, they do a great job of, of putting guys in the best position to be successful. Um, and and may, maybe that's maybe that's a Dory in there. Maybe that's somebody else. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to try to get the best 11 guys on the field uh, at different posi whatever position helps us, you know, make a make a play successful down in and down out. And Coach uh, John earlier in the call, he had mentioned how there are things that you stress out of your, your nickel guys, some of the responsibilities. When you're looking at these guys in this draft class, what are some of the things like the traits that, that you look to to make you feel like they could come in and help you out as a nickel? Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, I think there's a there's a versatility to, to be able to, to play against uh, two tight end sets with one of those guys being a, you know, a speed tight end or a move tight end. Uh, that maybe we want to play against and, and out of a substituted defense, uh, the, the ability to blitz, uh, the ability to, to play man and zone coverage, uh, and, and then more so now to be able to, um, you know, to match up on some vertical routes inside. I think for, for so long um, in the slot, there was this horizontal thought that, that guys had to work uh, defenses horizontally. And, and now we're seeing a lot more vertical routes that are coming out of the slot. Uh, so I think that that's you know something that's always a challenge when you when you're looking for players that that do all those things and and do them very well. Thanks, coach. Thanks, J. Rock. You got TD. TD. Uh, Eric Backrack had one for John. Hey, John. Uh, I'm Eric. curious if you've um, you know communicated any more with teams across the league ahead of the draft this year just because it, it might be um, a little bit harder or, or maybe more chaotic to communicate with them um, come draft day, just as it relates to potential trades or, or anything like that. Have you um, reached out or been reached out to more just from other teams across the league? 
I would say nothing more than than normal. I was on the phone with the team right before I jumped on here. Um, so, you know, I think those those phone calls will start to pick up. Um, you know, I talked to one team and and asked them if they were hearing anything up in the in the first part of the round, and they said it was pretty quiet so far. So, um, I think those conversations will start to start to heat up um, as we inch closer to to Thursday. Um, hearkening back to you know 2016 when we had moved back and then moved uh, back up to eight, you know that those conversations really didn't get fast and furious until um, Thursday morning and then Thursday afternoon when we um, when we finally you know jumped back up to to eight there with Cleveland. Uh, Jared Stillman had one for both John and Mike. Uh, just for John. Uh, John, when it comes to Logan Ryan and replacing him, are you looking at a corner who would probably be smaller but faster or looking for a guy who would maybe be, uh, in the case you talked about length, maybe longer but not as quick? Um, well, I, I think at the, at the end of the day, we talk about the, um, the corner position. Um, Mike and I always ask the, the the corners when we're talking to them, whether it's the senior bowl or the the um, you know the combine or when they come in on a visit. Like, what what are the most important things for a corner? Um, and they inevitably talk about their foot quickness or their speed or or this. And I kind of simplify it. We simplify it for them. It's like, don't let your guy catch the ball and tackle. So whatever shape or size that guy comes in, uh, the more times that they cover their guy. Um, or they knock the ball away and they tackle the guy who's got the ball. Um, that's that's what we're looking for. If it's a longer guy in there and and he can handle some of those routes, so be it. Um, if it's if it's a smaller guy that's 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 feisty and he's fast and not afraid to tackle, then then so be it. I think that, like I said earlier, we're trying to get as many guys in that back end there that can that can tackle and and keep their guy from catching the ball as possible. Is it harder for you to figure out exactly what you want in that regard when a lot of these guys didn't run at the combine and they were planning to run at their pro days? So you don't have an exact time and you can't look at it and say, okay, this guy could cover Brandon Cooks or Kenny Stills or T.Y. Hilton, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Jerry. And I think what you what you do is, um, I mean, you, you try to look at matchups. Are they matched up on some of those, you know, some of those guys who you know? Um, our scouts do a good job of getting – um, it's not, you know, it may not be 100% accurate, but we, we get a pretty good estimate on um, from the strength coaches around at these various universities about what their players have tested at. Um, and, and, and you see those matchups and if, if they're matched up on a speed guy, you know, are they able to kind of, are they able to stay with that guy? And you're trying to decipher what they're being asked of in coverage too, because, you know, maybe they're asked to cover him for a little while and then they're passing them off to somebody else. So there's a lot that goes in the, to the evaluation piece when you're determining to find a value of that player. Uh, Buck had a question for John. Actually, for both you guys, uh, good to talk with you. Hope you're doing okay. Um, good, Buck. Thanks, man. We spent a lot of time with Daniel Jeremiah on our media call talking about how football is becoming more positionless last week. I guess how much do you guys notice that trend in this draft in particular and how much more how much more difficult does it make your evaluation process uh, process when you're trying to figure out just how many different things you can do with a particular player? Um, I don't know about positionless because I think you have to have you have to have a, a defined role for for the player, and then the more the more the player uh, can handle from a mental and or physical standpoint, you know, you you put on that player. Now there there are some players in this draft that I think. Um, they are kind of hybrid players, whether that's, a, you know, a bigger safety that might could play linebacker or, a, you know, a really athletic safety that, that might could play nickel corner or corner. Um, but I think what we try to do as a football team is we try to try to evaluate and, and, and make a definitive statement on what uh, we think the role of the player is going to be and how they can impact our football team. Um, and then it's really, it's really up to the player. And that's what we tell the players when, when, when they get here is like, you know, you're, you're here, you're going to work at this position and what, what else you can handle. Um, you will determine that. 
Uh, same question for you, Coach. Um, you know, I just think that you got to be able to be in a room. I think that's the one thing when we talk about and John's like, well, whose room is he going to be? I think that's a question that he's always asked when we talk about a player's versatility and his ability to play um, more than one position. I think John wants to know, hey, well, whose room is he going to be in? What do we see? But I think it's critical that we always have a vision for the player. Uh, and, and that's made up of a scouting department, a coaching staff, uh, and when they're going to start. And then ultimately the role of the player is going to be determined by the player. Um, the more that they can do and more that they can handle, uh, the more that we'll give them. I would ex use a Monty Hooker as an example of that. He came in right away and as a safety, but played some different spots for us, played down a little closer, new nickel, learned nickel, new safety, was involved in all four of our special teams phases and played multiple positions on that. So he was a player that could handle a lot and, and then we gave him a lot. So, you know, that, that all gets determined by when, when we get them uh, and we can figure out what they can retain and how they fit into our system and what are we doing to put them in the best position to succeed. Thanks guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke had a question for uh, John. Yeah, Luke had uh, bumped out, but I've got this question here. This is Austin. Um, for John, how do you balance the need to you improve? The same person. I thought you guys were the same person for the first six months I was here. <laughs> uh, no, I'm quite a bit taller than Luke. Sorry, Luke. I'm joking. Uh, yeah, I know. But how do you balance, John, uh, the need to improve the team for this year versus planning for the future in this draft? Yeah, I think you're, you're always you're always looking at um, at, at um, certainly the current roster and how you're going to construct that and how that those players are going to impact this year's team. I think that's first and foremost. Um, but you're you're also looking at you know maybe some players in the in the in the latter part of of, of the draft that it, it might it, it might be a, a, you know a year or you know a, a two years before they really start to take off and blossom. Um, you see a kind of a developmental piece to their game. Um, and, and, and you, you, you have to keep that in mind as well, because the vision that we have for the player, um, it, we're going to be playing in 2021 and 2022 uh, as well. So uh, certainly the short term is at the, is at the forefront, um, but you're thinking about the long term as well. And coach, in your experience, how do you determine what kind of workload is fair to ask of a rookie? And uh, what factors play into that? Well, I mean, I think you, you give them, you know, you ask yourself, is this player changing positions? Are you asking them to go to a different position when you get here? Is it a defensive end that's going to an outside linebacker? That workload may not be as much. Or is this a player that's um, and has been in a similar system? We try to give them a lot. We, we do. And normally, under normal circumstances, I think that probably will change a little bit on this virtual meeting stuff. But we try to give them a lot uh, and see what they retain uh, and then fill in the blanks uh, as you go. And you're giving it to them uh, at rookie mini camp. Normally, you're giving it to them during the offseason program. You're giving it to them in, 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 uh, in the OTAs and you start to see you know, what they can develop and what what they can understand. I think this year is will be will be critical uh, that we probably don't do that, or that we don't throw a bunch at them, so that we don't lose them um, over these um, virtual uh, meetings and, and classroom sessions. So I'm very conscious of what that schedule looks like for those rookies and and how we're able to te teach them and get them brought up to speed. So this year may be a little different, Austin. But normally we're trying to throw a lot at them because we have them in person and we can have a lot of meetings with them. Appreciate it. Uh, Mike, you already had a question for John. John, thanks for doing this. Um, just a, a question in terms of you have some substantial gaps in picks. You know, I think it's 80 between your third round, and your fifth round, and 50 or so between the fifth and the seventh. Is that something that I, you're interested in trying to close the gap considering the depth of this draft? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we, if we've got a, if we've got the ability to, to, to maneuver around and, 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 and get picks and, and slide back a few and pick up extra picks to, um, I don't necessarily look at, look at it as, as, as gaps. Um, but if, if we're able to acquire some picks via moving around, I think we've, we've proven that we're, we're more than open for business uh, when it comes to navigating around the draft board. 
um, and positioning ourselves to get as many picks as possible. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Cal uh, Baxter had one for John. John, um, with given the uncertainty with the off season, and Mike kind of touched on it, do you have to maybe lower your expectations for your rookie class this year? I don't think you ever lower the expectations for anybody. I think we have a standard set in place and, um, you know, different players. I mean, players are different. People are different. Um, and, and we're going to, we're going to treat everybody the same. Um, we're going to expect them to come in and, tr and treat the team the way that, that, that they would want to be treated. We're going to, you know, put whatever on their plate that, that they can handle. Um, some guys might take off and, and blossom quick. It might take, Guys, some guys a little longer. That's no different than any other, than any other, you know, rookie class. Um, but they're going to have to buy into our, to our philosophy of how we go about doing things. Um, be accountable. Be dependable. Um, show up and, um, and 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 be a good teammate. And I think that that will never change. When you're judging edge positions, how do you weigh size versus speed? What do you mean? And which one to take? Yeah, like how do you do? You, which one is there? One of, of either size or speed? Do you value more for an edge guy, or is it? It's, it's I mean, you'd, you'd obviously like to have both, but I think you know. Again, play, players are different. There's, um, I, I I don't think that the uh, tackles are they're good in this game. I don't think that um, that you can just win by running around. Um, the edge of tackles all the time. There's, there's the tackles are good, and um, coaches put things in place to help you know stop that. So you have to have somewhat of an arsenal or developmental skill set that our coaching staff uh, can work with to improve. Um, but all of those things are important. You know, length, size, speed, ability to set the edge on early downs. Um, how crafty are they? Can you move them around? Can they rush inside? Can they stand up? Can they drop? Um, all of those things go into the evaluation piece. That's it. Thank you. I've got time for uh, two more. Uh, Chris Harris for uh, Mike. Hi, Mike. How are you, sir? Great, Chris. All right. Uh, John talked a little bit about his setup on draft time. I'm just cu curious to know your logistical setup. You obviously got the whiteboard there. Are you sequestered in a room? Is your family locked out? Like, what, what's going to be the protocol during, for you during the draft? Um, the whiteboard will probably be covered. You know, we were using that for some defensive stuff and John and I talked to some of these rookies and, you know, I like to draw on there. So it's better than drawing on a table. I'm in my basement and, um, you know, I don't know. I got a bunch of kids here and, and, and a wife. So um, I, I'm sure that they'll be watching the draft somewhere in the house, but uh, pretty comfortable with the conversations that we've had. And John and I were, unbelievably excited with our mock draft that we did with our organization. Um, I thought it was cool. I thought it was unbelievably functional. Uh, it was amazing the work that those, those people put in, whether it be our IT department, um, whether it be the, the scouting uh, department and, and some of those um, people involved with, with making sure that that was uh, the virtual draft was as perfect as it could be. And then just one more for you. Uh, you're such a hands-on coach. Uh, how tough is that going to be, these, these virtual uh, workouts and off-seasons when you can't physically get out there with the guys? Well, right now we're going we're gonna to work under the assumption that these are going to be virtual um, classroom opportunities and that we're going to try to, you know, share our message through, 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 through the classrooms virtually and get these guys – brought up to speed and, and start back over. You know, I think that's what you do every year is you start back over. You don't, you know, just jump in and assume that they know something. It's been a long time since they've been involved in football and and making sure that we go back to the basics and not rushing anything. That it, That's not my intent is to, to rush. Uh, it's to teach and make sure that that each and every guy is, is going to improve on, on their learning and their understanding of our, our offense or our defense or our special teams when we get done with this and when they tell us that they can come back in, you know, we'll have them back in and, and we'll, we'll evaluate where they are physically and mentally and, and see when we can practice. Thank you. Uh, Teresa will finish us up. I think she had one for uh, Mike. 
Mike, with this virtual offseason, are you all sending players equipment or monitors or, uh, you know, how are you trying to take care of, uh, you know, augmenting some of the equipment maybe they don't have? Well, I think it's identifying what they do have and what access they have. Um, but, you know, per, per the league, we're, we were able to, to send them with some equipment. We were also able to, to, to reimburse some equipment. Um, but, but for me, uh, it, it's, it's really critical that, that our players stay self-motivated. I, I believe that that uh, is going to be the, the core to this team success right now is that we're, we're self-motivated and that we're, we're building a routine and, and that when we are going to the meetings next week, uh, the voluntary phase, um, that, that, that players are uh, engaged if they choose to be there uh, and learning and that our coaches are, are going to be great teachers uh, during that phase.